Okay, so today with Sara Paschetti, tell us uh, about a way to rethink mirror symmetry as a local duality. Take it away. So thank you very much. Um, so I would like to, first of all, thank you for the invitation and uh, please uh, ask everybody, I mean, ask questions or just uh, interrupt me with uh, comments. Uh, this is gonna be useful, especially for myself to, listen to your opinion. So I'm gonna present some work done in collaboration with Matteo Saki and Chin Wang, who are postdocs uh, in uh, Oxford and Cambridge, and uh, Lea Buttini, who's a student in uh, Oxford. So um, the, um, the idea of this talk is to develop um, a new approach to study, to understand mirror symmetry that relates uh, uh, quiver theories in three dimensions and as we'll see also in four dimensions. So to begin with, I'm referring to the well-known case of uh, 3D and equal four theories, uh, which are related by mirror symmetry that acts as well in Higgs and Coulomb branches. And uh, if we realize these uh, quiver theories in, with a brain set up, we can interpret mirror symmetry as a consequence of S-duality. And uh, it was argued that actually this S duality can be uh, performed locally on each of five brains. So you can think that you really dualize an NS5 brain into a D5 brain, creating an S wall to its left and to its right. And you can do the same thing on D5 brains. Now, in field theory, we do understand what is the S wall. Uh, the S wall, uh, the S duality wall has a realization in three dimension as the TSUN quiver theory as uh, proposed by Gayot and Witt. And I think we all know what is TSUN theory, but anyway, I'm gonna uh, review it quickly. So what we are trying to do today is that uh, to go beyond understanding just what is the realization of the S-duality wall in three dimension, I want to understand what is the action of the s wall in field theory, how we understand this local dualization in field theory. So since naively, we know that in the brain setup, the uh, five brain associated to matters, uh, to matter field in the fundamental, and uh, NS5 brain instead are associated to bifundamental fields uh, connecting uh, gauge nodes. So we are after some uh, dualization of a fundamental field into a bifundamental and, this, and vice versa, which is performed by the action of the as duality wall, which I think is an operator that really acts on the fields and transform them. So really what I will present is- just, I have just one, one question. What's the meaning of the bar on the NS5 that you have? Um, the orientation is just after uh, performing the S dualization, but it's not going to play any role. It's just a notation. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, as you see for me, the signs, even the minus one signs are, uh, I mean, you will see how, how they appear. They are not playing an important role. Okay, so what I will present is an algorithm that uh, um, is going to use the property of the S, S wall and uh, two basic duality moves, which do essentially what I, I said, basic dualize are fundamental into by fundamental and vice versa. In terms of which I can dualize a linear quiver into its mirror dual. And, uh, Important is that the duality moves that I'm gonna use can be understood as genuine infrared dualities, which can in turn uh, pro be proven in terms of uh, cyber-like dualities. So I'm gonna uh, show that in a sense, mirror symmetry is a consequence of cyber-like dualities. So it's implied by a more fundamental type of duality. So earlier work uh, uh, where something along this line was, uh, was done, we're focused on the study of matrix models for uh, basically the uh, three, three sphere partition functions for n equal four theories. These are very simple matrix model. And it was basically argued that uh, if you study the partition function of a uh, linear quiver, you can understand this dualization at the level of the building blocks of the matrix model, understanding how you dualize the contribution of a D5 brain into the contribution of an NS5 brain. What we go, what we do here is that we are not just playing with the identities for partition function, we really understand in field theory, what is this dualization 
and as I said, it's gonna be an infrared dualities of cyber sequence of these uh, more fundamental cyber-like dualities. And uh, well, the, I must say that, of course, there is a precursor for the story uh, in, the, in the work by Kapustin Strassler. It was shown how to dualize piecewise a quiver into its mirror. Uh, but in this case, you have to consider only a billion theories. In that case, in, in the mirror symmetry was understood as a, basically a functional Fourier transform that allows you to dualize every a billion um, gauge field. Okay, so as I said, the uh, 3DS wall, just to be on the same page, is the three dimensional n equal four TSU and theory. It's a linear quiver where all the nodes are uh, unitary. And uh, this theory has an SUN manifest symmetry rotating the Higgs branch and uh, SUN symmetry, which is uh, emergent from the uh, announcement of the topological symmetry at each nodes. And uh, there are the moment map H and C of the Higgs and Coulomb branch, which are swapped by uh, the mirror duality. So an important fact, uh, if we want to understand that uh, TSUN is uh, the S duality wall, uh, so it is one of the generators of SL2Z. It has, in a sense, to satisfy a set of relations uh, that are the defining relations for the SL2Z generators. And um, the point is that we wanted to understand also these relations as a field theory statement. So basically, when we say S uh, square, we think that we are, in a sense, gauging together the, uh, the global symmetry one of the two SUN global symmetry of the TSUN theory, and we're supposed something like an identity operator. So we're gonna see how we understand also this type of relations as properties as, uh, of the three-dimensional theories. So uh, the theories that I will mostly focus on are the 3D linear and 4D linear quivers. So in three dimensions, we, we are thinking about the family Tiro Sigma, it's a family of uh, linear quivers with gauge node uh, U and I, and at each node we can have some matter uh, with um, rotated by a uh, UM I uh, global symmetry. So the data of this quiver are encoded into two sets of uh, two partitions, sigma and rho of N, which can encode the, the ranks of the gauge and flavor groups, and the mirror duality relates pairs of this theory where the partition rho and sigma are swapped. And of course, these uh, linear quivers are realized on a brain setup with uh, KD5 and LNS5, where K and L are related to uh, the partitions of N. So <clears throat> another comment before moving on is that these theory of sigma theories can also be understood as the formation of the TSUM theory. So you start from this uh, TSUN theory and you turn on some nilpotent VEV for the, Coulomb, for the Coulomb and Higgs branch moment maps. These uh, VEVs trigger an RG flow that uh, land you on the Tiro Sigma theory. And this definition is the definition that we use to construct the 4D version of these uh, uh, Tiro Sigma theories. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I mean, the, studying the the flow triggered by this web is quite non-trivial. So in, in this paper, we develop some uh, technology to study efficiently this uh, RG flow, which uh, is something that in 3D sometimes you bypass just reading out the effect of the, of the Higgs in just uh, at the level of the brain setup. So now uh, I wanted to also introduce the 4D uh, companion of this class of theories. Um, I've been talking about uh, 3D mirror theories, and uh, we recently proposed a, a for the version of these uh, families of theories related by mirror dualities. In fact, uh, uh, most of what we know about uh, 3D dualities for n equal to theories, for example, uh, is something that we, inf we can uh, also derive from our knowledge of n equal one uh, cyber-like dualities. Indeed, it is uh, by now well, uh, I will know machinery how you start from a 4D n equal one theory, you go down uh, to three dimension, maybe generating some monopole superpotential. This is, was mostly uh, explained very well in this, in this set of papers. And uh, it, with this procedure, you can 
construct uh, pairs of uh, cyber-like dual theories in three dimensions, starting from cyber-like dual theories in four dimensions. And then you can go ahead and turn on massive deformation, various real mass deformations, even to create Chef Simon's coupling. And so you can also, in this way, derive dualities with Chef Simon's uh, uh, coupling, starting from four dimensional and equal one cyber like dualities. So, in this pattern, actually, mirror symmetry seems to be escaping this, this story because it then look possible to have a 4D ancestor for 3D dualities, but this was done. We did it uh, starting from the uh, uh, um, first example of a theory in four dimensions that we found that en enjoys uh, what really looks like mirror duality. And, and then we constructed large families of 4D uh, mirror like dualities. So, this uh, ancestor of uh, um, 4D self dual theories, basically the 4D version of the TSU and theory. Uh, I, I think this theory probably is by now known to most uh, of you, but uh, it's called USP 2 n theory, is a four dimensional equal one quiver theory. The nodes, the gauge nodes are now symplectic, so it's USP 2 n 2, USP 2. Uh, USP2, USP4, and so on. And uh, then there are some uh, flavor symmetries that rotate, uh, a USP2 and symmetry that rotates uh, op Masonic operator that you construct with these uh, uh, color fields. And you can think that basically with this operator, you can create a sort of a, the, the for the version of the Higgs branch uh, moment map. And uh, then you have a bunch of uh, uh, SU2 uh, symmetries that rotate the fields uh, in the saw that they are supposed to combine and enhance in the infrared in a USP2N global symmetry. And this emergent symmetry is like the analog of the emergent topological symmetry that you have uh, in, uh, in three dimensions. In the, this theory here uh, in three dimension reduces to the TSUN theory. Now, uh, I mean, the, since this is, uh, I will be mostly talking about four dimension, it's good to have in mind uh, uh, visually how you take the, the 3D limit. So the idea is that in three dimension, you so are supposed to implement a series of uh, deformations that have the effect of breaking the gauge group from USP to UN. So in three dimension, you can just go ahead and replace this node with one, two, and, and minus one. So these are gonna be, UN node, and then you implement a, mass, a massive deformation that get, get rid of all the fields in the saw. And basically this uh, SU2 to the N symmetry or USP 2 N Y symmetry that was rotating uh, the fields in the saw becomes uh, the topological symmetry for your uh, three-dimensional theory. So in a sense, you can think that this saw structure that you have in four dimension replaces the Coulomb branch uh, that you have in, in three-dimensional theory, in the sense that you don't have monopoles, but you have mesonic operators that you construct with the fields in the saw that play the role of the monopoles in three dimensions. Now, this theory here indeed is, uh, uh, enjoys a mirror self-duality in the sense that uh, you can construct these two sets of operators, CNH, which are the analog of the Coulomb branch and Higgs branch moment map, uh, that are swapped by this uh, self duality, mirror self duality. And in three dimensions, re reducing it to the C and H uh, operator of uh, TSUN. Uh, on top of these important sets of operators, which are in the antisymmetric of the manifest and the emergent USP symmetry, there is an operator pi, uh, which is uh, invariant under the self duality, which is in the bifundamental of these two. Uh, with USP2 and symmetries. Okay, so this is like the 4D version of TSUN. So of course it's gonna be for us uh, the object that plays the role of the four dimensional S duality wall. And uh, starting from this uh, theory, we uh, turning on VEVs for this uh, uh, operator CNH, we study the flow uh, that has a, has a um, as end point, uh, what we baptize our E sigma rho theories, which are the four dimensional uplift of the three dimensional linear quiver. So these are basically uh, the uplift of the nilpotent web that are used in three dimensions. If you study this RG flow, 
you land on a quiver theory, which is again very similar to the three dimensional Tiro Sigma theory. Again, to go to three dimension, you just think of uh, um, breaking this uh, UN gauge, USP 2N gauge group to UN gauge group uh, and getting rid of the fields uh, in, the, in the saw with a massive uh, deformation. Then the, um, again, the, the partition rho sigma exactly as in three dimension and codes uh, the, the ranks of the gauge node and the uh, flavor nodes. And these uh, families of theories, uh, Eero sigma and sigma rho, are related by mirror duality, which swaps these two partitions. So whatever I'm going to say is going to refer to these families of theories, but keep in mind that at any moment you can go to three dimensions by doing this limit, which is completely standard. Okay, so uh, the question that I posed at the beginning about uh, whether it is possible to understand uh, locally mirror symmetry as an action on the field, the local action of the field uh, can be asked also in, the, in this four dimensional case. And um, so the, the starting point is to understand uh, uh, how the S wall, which in this case, uh, the four dimension is identified with this uh, USP 2 n theory, uh, can, end, can uh, satisfy uh, relations that we interpret as the property of the S duality wall and how using this S wall, I can dualize uh, fundamental into by fundamental and vice versa. So this is what I'm gonna uh, explain now. So I'm gonna use this compact notation, the wiggle line connecting to square nodes. That is a compact expression for the USP 2 n theory that I discussed above. So X and Y, these vectors are the fugacity in the two USP 2 n uh, global symmetry. And uh, so this is the, one of the two symmetries, of course, is emergent. So this is a compact notation that makes visible the two symmetries, even the emergent one. T and C are the fugacities for the two U1 symmetry because the complete symmetry is the product of the USP 2 n times P 2 n symmetry, and then you have two um, U1 symmetry, U1 T and U1 C. Okay, so the first important property that I'm going to prove is uh, the property uh, that tells us that if you glue two S walls, you get an identity wall. Um, so it really means that I am gauging uh, the diagonal combination of one of the two uh, USP 2 n symmetry of uh, these two blocks. And uh, then, okay, the gauging is performed introducing an extra uh, chiral multiple in the joint couple to the moment map uh, to the anti-symmetric uh, anti operators to the left and to the right. The, this superpotential identifies the T you want the symmetries on each side and uh, basically kills the diagonal combination of the U1C symmetry. So you, you also have this identification of the U1C fugacity. Um, this identity wall uh, operator is an operator that uh, uh, basically at the level of the superconformal super index is a distribution, is a, is a proportional to a Dirac delta function that really has the effect of identifying the cartons of the two global symmetry. It's really what you expect from uh, identity operator. So the identity operator identifies this usp 2 n group with this other usp 2 n So you, you identify the global sim, the cartons in the two USP 2 n, then there are some permutation going on and some prefactors. But really, uh, the physics is that the identity wall is there because it is identifying the two uh, global symmetries. Um, I'm going to show you how you prove this formula. But first, um, the point is that if you take the 3D limit that I mentioned several times, where you break, where you compatify to the dimension and perform the various RG flow, you then can recover both this defining relation of USP 2 n and the minus sign appear basically, can appear depending on how you embed the USP when inside USP 2 n So we have these two uh, options. It is really a flip in the sense of the sign of the cartons of UN when you, when you take the 3D limit. So, okay, so how do I prove this statement and what is the meaning of this statement? As I said, as I promised, 
I am going to interpret all of these uh, statements as dualities. So uh, the two ingredients of the proof are the iterative application of the interligator pool of duality. And this, uh, as we said, has the effect of splitting uh, the theory that you obtain by gluing together these uh, duality walls into a product of simple theories, which are SU2 theories with two flavors. And uh, the second uh, ingredient is the fact that this SU2 theory with two flavors is, um, is a theory which uh, has a quantum deform model in space. And uh, indeed, so there is a, a, this constraint for the Fafian, which will be classically zero, but by quantum effects, it's broken. And uh, that means that uh, the global SU4 symmetry is uh, it's broken. So uh, it means that if you try to gauge some part of this uh, flavor symmetry, then uh, because of this, uh, uh, Carol symmetry breaking, actually, uh, you cannot really gauge the symmetry. You, if you try to gauge it, they, you hit the group that you are trying to gauge. So that's, and as a matter of fact, uh, this is reflected in the fact that the um, index for this uh, theory, which uh, has a carol symmetry breaking, uh, indeed uh, is a proportion to a delta function. This observation was done by Spigdonov Farton of some years ago in a nice uh, paper. So let me first discuss this in a bit more detail. Uh, so how do I understand this uh, delta function appearing at the level of the index? So this is going to be very sketchy, but just to give you the flavor of the proof. So one can start uh, with the SU2 theory with three flavor. In this case, the theory is as confined and is dual to a Vesdomino model. So at the level of the index, you have the, the electric theory, which involves an integral over the uh, SU2 Cartan, it's equal to bunch of uh, elite gamma function, and each gamma function is uh, the contribution of the of a chiral. So here you have just the contribution of the chirals which live in the Vesumino model. If you integrate out two chirals, so uh, you go down to the theory you want with two flavor. This is done by basically taking a particular uh, limit for two fugacities. That's implementing the mass deformation, the complex mass deformation for one flavor. What happens is that if you study um, the index, you find that first of all, it looks that the index vanish identically after you implement this limit. But if you look more closely, you actually see that there are poles uh, that appear for specific values of the fugacities. And the correct way to deal with these uh, poles is to think that the index uh, it's a, like a distribution and you want to integrate it with a test function. So you construct something like this. You, you take your index as a function of one of the fugacity. You focus on one fugacity and you integrate it with a test function. And uh, basically you figure out that when this fugacity get close to some of the singularity, uh, which are three, and in a sense, since there are four chirals, uh, you may think that the, the singularity appears when this fugacity for the first color that you choose get closer to the remaining three. So there are three singular points. And uh, when you uh, study what's happening the, um, when you are close to one of the singularity, basically you notice that the integration contour is trapped by between singularities and the correct way to perform the integral is really to evaluate the test function on the singularity. And since you can do this for generic test function, you learn that basically the index is uh, proportional to delta function that are set in your uh, uh, fugacity equal to uh, some particular value. So that's very sketchy because then you have to consider, I mean, other uh, contribution from all the singularities you have to combine together, but that's the idea. And uh, in fact, for us, since we have additional singlets, uh, the building block identity for SU2 with flav two flavors plus some singlet is just plainly going to be proportional to a delta function, like, like it's just product of two, uh, sum of two delta functions. Okay, so that's the first ingredient of the proof. And uh, remember, we are trying to prove that if you glue two S walls, you get the identity wall. So how do I prove this? 
So let's do it uh, uh, in a specific case. So n equal to three. So I'm doing two s walls of length three. And uh, so here I'm imagining that I'm doing a Lagrangian glue. So I'm gauging the manifest uh, USP6 global symmetry of the two, of two S walls. So I'm studying uh, this quiver. And now you start uh, going to the quiver with uh, iterations of uh, the interligator period duality. So interligator period duality tells us that USP2 and theory with two and F flavors and no superpotential is dual to USP 2 and F minus 2 and C minus 4, and the superpotential, which involves the flip of these uh, uh, mesons. So the first node is a, uh, remember that each of these nodes in this construction come with an anti-symmetric. So you cannot directly apply the duality because you want zero superpotential. However, the first node is a USP 2, so the anti-symmetric is a singlet. So I can really apply the duality at the first node. And uh, as I dualize the first node, the rank stays the same, but because of these uh, uh, singlets, basically we remove the anti-symmetric the, in the next node. So I can proceed, I can keep going. And uh, here I'm, uh, I keep going until I reach the middle node. Again, the effect is to, um, um, so I, I dualize the second node. I now arrive to the, to the third node. And this node I can dualize because uh, now the anti-symmetric is removed. But now the node, this rank uh, starts decreasing. It becomes a two. And uh, remove the anti-symmetric to the next node. Now, when I try to apply the duality to this node, I see that this confines because this is uh, the case in which the dual rank is zero. So at this point, I split the quiver in a part, which is uh, the, the same structure. So two S walls of uh, shorter length and a bit, which is just S2 with four chirals plus some singlets that I'm not drawing. So you can iterate the procedure. You can again uh, start dualizing uh, this part uh, with interligator Puglio. And this has the effect of splitting also this bit into uh, two parts. So you can understand, imagine how it goes. So if you iterate for an arbitrary long uh, quiver, this procedure, and times you get many bits, which are SU2 with four flavors, and each of them have uh, um, uh, basically an index, which is proportional to a delta function, which identifies uh, the cartons of these SU2 flavor symmetries. So in, a, in the end, you reconstruct uh, a, a multi-dimensional uh, delta functions that uh, identifies uh, uh, the cartons of this side of the quiver with this uh, side of the quiver. So that's how the delta function appears. And uh, a similar proof uh, can be performed directly in three dimensions. The language uh, in, the, in three dimensions, you don't have this whole structure, so you can proceed very similarly. The identity to use is now our own duality. You are only dualize the quiver until you split it into smaller bits. And the fundamental bits are just U1 theory with no matter and just some BF coupling. And the delta function there is set by the integration over the U1 uh, gauge field that sets to zero, basically the, uh, the, the, back, the background the vector multiplet and this implements the delta function. Questions about this? <clears throat> can, can you uh, repeat or re-explain how you get rid of the, um, the anti-symmetric in the first uh, arrow, the first uh, duality that you make? Uh, here? So, well, here I understand that the, it, it decouples, but then, yeah, yeah the second step, okay. how do you get rid of the, the anti-symmetric on the four? Yes, okay, so when I dualize this node, um, the dual node is again an USP2. So this is a USP2. Yeah. Then I have all these flipping fields, the XIJ uh, matrix of flipping fields. Uh, and these, uh, they basically give mass uh, to this uh, adjoint. Mm -hmm. okay. so it becomes massive and it is integrated out. And these effects propagates. So mm -hmm. when I now dualize this node here, uh, I remove the anti-symmetric to the 
next node, but then I reconstruct them asymmetric at the previous node because of these flipping fields. Mm -hmm. So this uh, uh, integrator polyduality can propagate nicely along this quiver. And the same is true for our own duality propagate nicely on the UN three-dimensional quivers. Mm -hmm. If you take TSUN, you can do the same with the RONI. So, so the effect of these uh, flipping fields is to remove or add an anti-symmetric on the neighboring gauge nodes, and they don't touch the, the other bifundamentals. Uh, so you, I mean, when you do a dual, I mean, you create all the possible arrows in a sense, but say this arrow you don't create because it's massive. And uh, indeed you create these, uh, but then you make some other massive. Indeed, you see there is a permutation of this. Uh, ah, yes, okay, left. okay, okay. Okay, I see. Yes, thank you. Good. Okay, so that's the a trick that we keep using in different uh, uh, cases. So if you, I mean, if you understand this, um, um, by the same logic, we can prove most of the dualities that are involved in the in the talk. Okay, so another ingredient. This is uh, slightly ugly to see, but it's very simple. That we need is an anti-asymmetric. Uh, S wall. So, so far I've been talking about an S wall that connects uh, uh, two USP, two M or two N symmetries, but you can try to break uh, the USP two N symmetry to USP two M times SU2. You can do that by um, suitable deformation. So now, uh, so the level of fugacity, basically that means that some of the fugacities are identified with that of an SU2 symmetry and then there are some suitable geometric progression in terms of uh, the other one symmetry. It's similar to the nilpotent uh, VEVs that uh, you do to go from uh, TSUN to, to the tiro sigma. And uh, this is, is going to be important to have uh, this asymmetric wall because then, uh, for example, you can construct uh, also the asymmetric identity wall which you obtain if you glue an S wall to an asymmetric S wall. And uh, so nothing fancy, you keep identifying the cartan of the USP 2 symmetry with that of the broken uh, USP 2 n symmetry, which is broken to USP 2 n times SU2. So there is a slightly more complicated delta function, but morally is the same. Uh, but I'll, I'm gonna need this asymmetric wall uh, in a moment. And you so can uh, yes. What is the symmetry of this theory? So the USP two M is broken. Uh, USP two N. So you you start yeah. from the theory which has a USP. Sorry, you have USP two N X symmetry, and mm -hmm. then you have USP two M times SU two symmetry, and then you have also U one times two U one symmetries. But uh, on the bottom, so what does it mean? So M is uh, smaller than N. So what is the delta function does? Right. As I said, so here you have the vector of uh, N cartons for uh, mm -hmm. X1 to Xn. You identify the first M to Y1 to Ym, and the remaining one are identified uh, just with SU2, fugacity V, and some powers of T, like a geometric progression. Oh, but uh, I'm asking as a theory, like as a theory, this looks like it has the USP 2M times SU2N times SU2 symmetry. So do you say that like some part of the SU2N doesn't act on anything or? So, so this is, I mean, this is a, the singular theory, right? Because it's mm -hmm. like the, um, it's like the, the wall theory. So it, there is a, I mean, so let me just go back. Even uh, in this theory, what is the symmetry here? It's like the symmetry is broken because you have, uh, right. in a sense, you can think there is an operator pi here and an operator pi in the by fundamental of these uh, two uh, symmetries. So there is an operator, right? Pi, say, left and pi right, which are basically by fundamental in OSP2X and this gate symmetry. Uh, so then you have, in a sense, that pi L, pi R has a new zero wave. I see. OK, thank you. Yeah. And it's the same here. 
And uh, maybe another question. What is special about SU2? Can you do another like part, USP, a bigger part? Or? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think you can do, yes. I mean, of course you can do whatever uh, uh, partitions you want. Uh, yes, definitely. I, and you will, I, still, I get, just... and you will still get such uh, asymmetric walls, like such delta functions or? Um, yeah, I would say that you still have something like a delta function, but a more intricate identification pattern. But uh, mm -hmm. I would say, I would say yes. I see. Thank you. I mean, you will identify these cartons with uh, these cartons divided into blocks. Uh, mm -hmm. Which, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we need. Uh, in the end, to get to the basic uh, identity duality moves that I mentioned at the beginning. So we are trying to find uh, the duality moves that correspond to the dualization of a D5 brain into an S5 brain and vice versa. So the first uh, duality move that I need is uh, how I transform a bifundamental field into a fundamental field sandwich between two S holes. And this is what I have here. So here I have a fundamental field and it is sandwiched between two S walls and uh, it is dual to a bifundamental field. Remember that if the four dimensional version comes with the triangle, but if you think in three dimension, you just forget about the so and you just focus on a bifundamental, which is uh, dualized into S D5, S to the minus one in a sense. And this is your contribution of uh, a D5. And then I have the, the dualization of uh, say 2L chirals in the fundamental, which is dualized into uh, a sequence of triangles, which corresponds to fundamentals, which are uh, by fundamentals, which are sandwiched between two S walls. And uh, these are the basic duality moves that we're gonna use uh, in the algorithm. And uh, they can be uh, proven, these two duality moves, uh, uh, by iterations of the integrator pool duality. So same technology we use. So let me show you the first uh, example. So here I'm showing you how a bifundamental, an SU USP4 and USP4 bifundamental is dualized. In this case, it's a bifundamental connecting two gauge nodes of the same rank, so it's a bit simpler. This is uh, dualized into two S walls that sandwich a flavor in a single flavor, which is an SU2 doublet. So this uh, compact expression, when you, uh, when you open it up, uh, uh, you have that this is the USP4 theory, which is the S-wall on the left. That's the S-wall on the right. And then you have the insertion of the flavor in the middle. And uh, you simply proceed with the same uh, technology that is uh, dualizing uh, with interligator Pulio. And uh, as you proceed, basically what you observe is that these flavor nodes uh, in the end uh, moves until it's attached to the last node. And then uh, when you get to this configuration with the flavor attached to the last node, in the last iteration, you confine sequentially all the nodes until you arrive uh, uh, to a vest minimum. It's a simple sequence of uh, dualization with interligator Pulio. So this is really a, a consequence of iterations of a basic uh, uh, cyber-like duality. And for me, this is going to be one of the fundamental duality moves. That is, I have my bifundamental that becomes a fundamental sandwich between two S words. Uh, I can slightly generalize. This is actually useful comment for later. If I have uh, two L fundamentals to dualize, I can think of uh, splitting two L by separating them by identity walls. So now I separate these two L chirals into L doublets, and this is gonna be useful because now I dualize with the fundamental move each, uh, each uh, structure will have uh, S, uh, S to the minus one and the fundamental in between, this becomes a triangle. 
Okay, so uh, this is what I just told you. So S wall, L fundamentals, S wall is a bunch of triangles. Now I just glue an S wall on this side and an S wall on this side, and I have uh, the dualization uh, of just 12 fundamentals into a string of bifundamentals sandwiched between two S walls. So, so yeah. Uh, how, for, for given the uh, quiver, how many dualities uh, do you have? Uh, so dualities, uh, you mean... Uh, uh, I, I, there is a simplest move, right? I mean, I can do lots of du dual frame. I probably can do infinite frame. I can just do one duality move. I can do a, a basic uh, duality move. Um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to get to the, what we call the mirror dual by a sequence of elementary moves. Okay, but it, it just makes me wonder if there is a cluster algebra structure ah. here. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a good question. If you, if you can see it, that would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if there is a basic move, right, which is repetitive, but you do it on different nodes each time, then, yeah. then there will be... <clears throat> I mean, I agree. I think uh, the, the bottom line of this talk is that you only need to use uh, in a smart way integrator Puglio to prove uh, mirror. Um, mm -hmm. Then, uh, yeah, if there is a nicer st structure, uh, that would be nice. But I, at the moment, I, I don't know how to, how to see, but yeah, if you have ideas, that would be great. Okay, Th thank you. Yeah, well, I guess one, one thing to ask is what is the minimal number of these elementary dualities to go from sigma rho to rho sigma, for instance? Maybe yeah. this number can be expressed in terms of rho and sigma. If you ask the number of steps or the numbers of dual, because uh, it depends how you phrase the question. I mean, I only use integrator Puglio. Yeah, so the, number the number of times you have to use this. Okay, I understand. Okay, then I can count. Then definitely I can count. Yeah. And then there must be some combinatorial formula. Yeah. Maybe. But the, the basic move is just, I mean, the really basic identity is integrator Puglio. Yeah. Then uh, from there, I cook up uh, uh, the basic moves, uh, which are uh, two independent. In fact, there are three moves which are, one is the identity wall, and then there are the dualization of the fundamental and the, uh, and, the, and the vice versa, but only two out of three are independent, but all of them are consequence of integrator mm -hmm. So, But yeah, I can count <laughs> times. I need to use integrator Puglio to prove yeah. each basic move. And then it's very easy to count how many basic moves I, I do. That's very easy. I can do the counting, not on the spot. I need to sit down yeah. a bit. Yeah. Okay, so I think I'm basically ready to uh, state the algorithm. So the algorithm works like this. I give you a linear quiver and you chop the quiver, engaging the gauge nodes into either triangles or fundamental blocks. If you are in three dimension, you don't have triangle, just have a sequence of by fundamental and fundamental flavors. And then you dualize each block using the basic duality move, which I wrote again here. So a triangle becomes uh, basically this structure with the uh, S wall, S wall, and the flavor in between. And then if you have flavors, they are dualized by S wall, S wall with a bunch of triangles in between. Then once you are dualized each block, you glue back the dualized block and integrating over the original gauge nodes. And in this way, you you, this integration produces some identity walls. And the effect of these walls is to basically to remove. Uh, once you do this gauging, you are left with a quiver which contains no S walls. It's an ordinary quiver. But some of the fields maybe have some web with this procedure. And then you are supposed to study the web triggered by this, uh, the flow triggered by this web. So I guess the, an example is probably more clear. So here is an example of a 3D linear, of a 4D uh, linear quiver. It's 
corresponds to this uh, theory in the year of sigma classification. So one of the partitions is trivial. So now here I have uh, two gauge nodes uh, and uh, I do the step number one by splitting uh, into triangles and uh, fundamentals. So I, for convenience, I completed with a trivial by fundamental, the left triangle and the right triangle. So I have three triangles and then I have eight uh, chirals. And the block for the flavors, remember, contains uh, also the identity wall. And then I perform the dualization. So to each triangle, I associate the structure of S wall, S wall and field, uh, chiral field in the middle. And to the flavor, I replace the structure where you have uh, now four triangles sandwiched between two S walls. So this is the step of the dualization. Now, I, you see here I have the original gauge nodes, which I, I had frozen initially. Now I, again, <laughs> integrate over. And when I integrate over here, I reconstruct uh, identity walls, precisely those uh, asymmetric identity walls that uh, I mentioned at, at the beginning. And uh, these S wall, uh, basically I, these identity walls, uh, um, I can, uh, used to basically Higgs this gauge node, which is frozen to some particular value. And similarly, uh, this gauge node is frozen to some value. So implementing uh, the, um, these uh, identity walls uh, will end on this quiver theory. So you see now the, there are no longer wiggle lines. There are no S walls involved. There are all, only uh, fields. But now, uh, so this blue line is special. This blue line indicates that these are actually two doublets with specific uh, uh, charges under the abelian symmetry. And if you look at them, you, you realize that they have a web. They got some expectation value. You can even follow from the superpotential that there is uh, a superpotential um, turn on that uh, um, implements a web for one of these two doublets. And uh, then you have to study the Higgs mechanism that is uh, uh, produced by the fact that one of these two doublets uh, has a web. And the effect of this web is to uh, break this USP2 gauge group to uh, USP4 gauge group to USP2. And uh, this flavor is basically then connected to the previous node. And uh, so once you arrive, uh, at the configuration where there are no longer they have turned on, you look at this theory and you realize that that's precisely the mirror theory uh, that you were expecting for this type of quiver. So that was the first example of the algorithm. Let me make a comment and then I have another example. So comment is that uh, our moves mimic um, the effect of the local five brain dualizations. But as we know, in terms of uh, brains, when we perform this local dualization on the brains, then we have to uh, reshuffle the brain to make sure that the five brain sit in configuration where there is zero net D3 numbers for them. So you have to do this sequence of moves uh, to reach those configurations. In, in, the, in this algorithm, you you don't have to do it. You, I mean, you do it in this when automatically when you are uh, studying the RG flows that are initiated by the VEVs that are naturally created by these uh, identity walls. And these VEVs then propagate along the quiver. And in this propagation, they change the ranks and also move the position of the flavors until you reach the, uh, the mirror theory. And in fact, it's not too bad to study how this flow happen because you can at the level of the index you can use this technology of taking uh, pinching the integration contours and see how the ranks change and how the flavor moves along the quiver so to uh, illustrate a little bit better this let me go for another example where you see how this flow uh, propagates so i'm studying now the 
the case of the super QCD. Uh, so I forgot here anti-symmetric. So, the, so now I have a USP-1 theory with 2K chirals. First step, I split it into blocks. So I, as usual, I complete the quiver with trivial by fundamentals. So now I have uh, two triangles and a block of K flavors. Then I dualize. As usual, I replace each triangle with the uh, S-wall sandwich in uh, flavor. And then I have a string of uh, K triangle sandwich, sandwich by two S-wall. So I'm here. I integrate over the uh, original gauge nodes. So then I implement uh, this uh, asymmetric uh, identity wall. You see that now I am basically identifying the and cartons of this USP2N symmetry just with one uh, fugacity for uh, this SU2 symmetry. And all these uh, um, cartons for these uh, gauge nodes are identified with the same SU2 symmetry, but uh, with um, each of them has a different powers of T. So there is another uh, fugacity for the U1C. So the quiver that you land on, it's, uh, it's this quiver. So you have a string of usp 2 n gauge node here. And then you have, at the end of the quiver, you have these, uh, um, these bits. So these, these represent uh, n doublets, uh, and they have the effect of pinching the integration contour n times uh, here. And same story here, you have n doublets pinching the contour n minus one times. So from USP2n, uh, this gauge nodes is broken to USP2 and the web propagates. So now in the next step, the first node is now a USP2 and the flavors are now attached to the next node. Now there are n minus one doublets pinching the contour n minus two times. And this propagation, continues until uh, you reach the dual frame where basically you extinguish the, the, the number of doublets fixing these gauge nodes. So the propagation ends and it ends precisely where it's supposed to end. That is after you reconstructed the full tail going from USP2 to USP2N. And here for comparison, I'm writing downstairs the 3D n equal four mirror and you can see how they, they relate. So I have a comment here. So one comment is that uh, in this procedure, it's very easy to keep track of fugacities and for the global symmetries. So uh, since remember, these are the fugacities for the flavor symmetry and they are related to the fugacities for these bifundamentals. So for each flavor, in a sense, you, you have a triangle. And uh, in three dimensions, uh, uh, as I said, you are supposed to forget about this so structure that in a sense replaces the, the, the Higgs branch. And indeed, um, you can follow what happens in three dimension and you see that uh, this is how the FI parameters relates to the fugacity for the as to symmetry of the so. So now you have uh, that basically these are x1 to xk are from your cartons of the UK flavor symmetry. And this is the mirror map that tells you how they are mapped to the FI in the mirror dual theory. And basically you have the difference of uh, the cartons of the OSP symmetry that reconstruct the phi uh, in your theory. So this is the first comment. So this is very useful if you want to know the mirror map. And uh, um, for example, then I, um, I mean, you can decide, for example, to, to gauge some of these uh, uh, U1 symmetry uh, to, to promote some of these uh, UN node from UN to SUN, then you know what to do on this side because you know uh, the map. Um, something that also, was a bit of a surprise is that, uh, for, I mean, although we know this profound uh, 
link between 4D and 3D was to observe that in the 4D theory has same pathologies as the 3D theory when uh, you pass the goodness threshold, which was a bit unexpected uh, for this 4D n equal one theory. Indeed, when this number k, uh, USP to k, it's uh, less than 2n, then you observe that, for example, if you study these mesons, it falls below the unitarity bound. And indeed, this meson in three dimension is mapped to the fundamental monopoles. And so it is good that it's violating the bound, although uh, there is no direct link between uh, uh, you know, the, the violation of the bound in 4D and you know, the violation of the bound in 3D. There is in between, there is lots of archi flow uh, of mass deformation that you have to know. Yet uh, you have the same uh, um, problem. And the problem appears also when you study the propagation of webs, because when you study the propagation of web in this regime, then something tricky starts happening and we are starting to look into this. Somehow uh, these two fields start uh, crossing each other and then the propagation seems complicated. So it was a bit surprising to see that this 4D theory seems to suffer similar pathologies as bad theories uh, in three dimensions and we are now uh, studying uh, them. Okay, uh, questions on this? Sorry, you, you, you say you're done? Uh, no, uh, I have- ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> if, I, if I have a- uh, no, 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 continue, continue. Yeah, yeah, I just wasn't sure. But I can ask a quick question maybe now since you ask. Yes. Um, so in, in 4D, you have many in-between steps when you do these IP dualities. And then you have a final answer and the, the first and the last, they relate in 3D as 3D mirror symmetry. Is there an interpretation of the in-between? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, these basic moves, you have them also in 3D, it's the same. Uh, I mean, okay. you can really apply the algorithm in three dimensions, it's the same. I uh, see, okay, okay. So in three dimension, you can you can prove either by taking the limit of these uh, basic moves, or you you redirect them by using instead of integrator polio, you use Aroni, but it's the same. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You can prove that if you take a bi fundamental in three dimension, then it's the same of S wall S wall fundamental in between, where S wall now is TSUN. Mm -hmm. Same, and he and similarly you can take uh, TSUN a string of bifundamental TSUN, so you, you forget this part. And this is the same as just uh, a bunch of uh, hypers in the fundamentals. So you can you have exactly the, the same duality moves and the same way to derive them. And you can apply this, this algorithm of chopping and dualizing locally, uh, also in 3D. OK, thank you. OK, uh, so I have uh, um, Okay, I have a first set of conclusions, uh, and then uh, if I have just time, I will say something quickly. So what I've said so far is that we have uh, constructed this uh, algorithm in four dimension and three dimensions uh, to construct mirrors uh, uh, of a linear quiver with two basic uh, uh, duality moves uh, and the properties of the S wall. And, uh, we can generalize this to circular quivers and to quivers involving uh, uh, S-walls, so the so-called 3D S-walls. Um, and we can also construct uh, more general duals uh, because so far we have been considering duals that you generate acting with the S generator of SL2Z, but you can do more. You can take the T generator and uh, you can do any element of SL2Z and perform this local dualization. So this is something that we are doing now. We are constructing duals, lo doing local dualization involving generic elements of SL2Z. And uh, in all these cases, in the end of the day, all the basic move and consequently the full duality can be proven by iterating the intelligence of your duality. So, the comment that, uh, I mean, comes is that, uh, is, it, is there something, uh, uh, so what is so important about the integrator Puyo, or in general, is it possible that there is some minimal set of fundamental dualities in terms of which maybe we can derive all dualities? 
I don't know. So I unfortunately cannot answer this question, but for sure, I mean, if you, in, so in all this story about mirror symmetry, we just used basically directly interligator pool just proceeding along the quiver, but you can enlarge a lot the, you know, the room <laughs> for your manipulation if you use uh, some fundamental duality like integrator Pulio or uh, other fundamental duality. For example, if you have a unitary group or special unitary, you can use Cyberg. Uh, if you use the so-called deconfinement technique. And uh, so this deconfinement technique is uh, in fact an old idea in the 90s where you trade uh, some matter in a rank two representation for an XLVH node and they use uh, indeed uh, an elementary uh, as confining dualities. And this idea has been recently revamped uh, now as a sequential deconfinement, which is a, um, an upgrade of this idea, if you want, because now you still use the deconfinement move, but you include it in a sequence actually of moves that you apply iteratively to prove something more complicated. And uh, in fact, I think with Matteo, we figure out that this story um, of the, the idea of sequentially the confining, we took it in fact from uh, uh, the world of uh, free field correlators in, uh, in, uh, in two-dimensional conformal field theory. And I mentioned this in last time I gave the quiver meeting here, but then, I mean, this idea, we noticed that then can be applied to 3D and equal to theories. Then there was lots of work on this, uh, uh, 3D deconfinement, the there are examples in 2D, and then recently there is work also in the 4D application of the sequential deconfinement technique, and uh, well, there is also this nice uh, uh, version of the deconfinement that appears in the work of uh, um, these people, um, but there, there is also an interpretation at the level of uh, brains, whereas here is entirely uh, field theoretic. So what is, just to uh, conclude what is this, uh, uh, how does this uh, sequential deconfinement work? Uh, so here is an example in four dimension. I have a West P2N theory with six chirals, which just for convenience, I'm splitting into three doublets, but really you should consider this is six chiral rotated by an SU6 uh, symmetry. And there is an anti-symmetric, uh, but there is no super potential. So the anti-symmetric is not coupled to um, any of the fundamental fields. Uh, well, the, actually there is a super potential because this cross means that there are some traces of the anti the powers of traces of the anti-symmetrics are flipped. This is just for um, avoid problems with the uh, violation of unitarity. So how does the idea of the deconfinement work? So the idea is that you can use integrator pulio duality uh, to start, say, from this auxiliary quiver, where you have an extra gauge node, but no anti-symmetric. And now, if you start from this auxiliary node and you use integrator Pulio on the first node, you see that uh, this node confines, and precisely by the mechanism that we saw before, you re restore the anti-symmetric at the original node. Uh, if you instead apply integrator Pulio duality to the second node, then you confine this node and uh, you reconstruct the symmetric at the first node. So in going from the first quiver to the second quiver, passing through the auxiliary quiver, basically you knock down the rank by one unit and you produce uh, some singlets. Um, so basically these two theories are almost identical, if not that one of the as to two symmetry is actually broken by some of the singlets. And here, I mean, I also wrote the fugacities, but uh, the important thing is that the two theories are almost the same. There is the same number of uh, um, charge fields, uh, just that the rank has decreased and you produce some number of singlets. So you see, you created an iteration and uh, you can iterate this procedure to knock down the rank at each step by one unit, producing each time a packet of 15 singlets. And if you iterate this uh, procedure, in the end, uh, you reach uh, a dual frame where you have a best minus. So you can prove a more complicated duality like this duality relating the USP2N theory to a best minus theory 
just iterating a basic duality, which is an integrator Puglio with this technique of the confinement, which in this case, it's very simple because you simply uh, they confine one node and you introduce an auxiliary quiver. As I was mentioning, in fact, the sequential deconfinement now is, can be a bit more sophisticated. You can prove, uh, for example, <coughs> more fanny dualities like a duality relating this quiver, which has two gauge node, USP2N and USP2M. You can show that this uh, theory is actually uh, self dual with the two nodes swapped. And this can be proven with uh, the confinement, but now the, to construct an iteration, you have to perform uh, uh, more moves than simply the confinement. So for example, in the, in the first step, you want to just deconfine the antisymmetric at the first node. So you create, you go to the auxiliary quiver, which contain an extra USP2 and minus two node. Then you uh, can dualize this node and uh, the, it is becomes a USP 2 n node and you reconstruct the antisymmetric at the previous node, but you remove it to the next one, the one to the next one. And now you dualize also the last uh, uh, node. So you, there are three moves. And now if you compare the original quiver and this quiver after, so this is the effect of the iteration, you knock down the rank of the first node and you create an extra node to the right hand side. So it's like some of the rank has crossed the middle node and it has moved to the right. Um, in general, you can go to a frame where the first node is knocked down by K unit and you have moved the rank to the right hand side until you continue iterating and for K equal to M, you just get to a self-dual self frame. So this type of duality, in fact, was, uh, I mean, it's called cross-leg duality precisely by, because of this fact you, in a sense, move the rank from uh, uh, the left node to the right node. It's something that we, in a sense, uh, um, we were inspired to, to look for this duality from uh, work in two-dimensional uh, conformal field theory where this type of manipulation indeed was called cross leg duality. And uh, it's funny that if you prove uh, self dualities in general, this uh, can be related to some form of, of enhancement. And indeed we observe that this theory has a um, symmetry enhancement to E6 where these SU3, uh, three SU3 factors recombine into an E6 symmetry. So this is just to say that with a cross neck, uh, with a sequential deconfinement manipulation, you can really prove uh, very sophisticated dualities. And uh, this uh, enlarges a lot, uh, you know, the space of uh, um, dualities that you can prove using fundamental dualities. Sarah? Yeah. In this example, uh, what is special, special about three? Can you have other uh, numbers? Or? Uh, here. Yes. Um, I, I mean, um, so this is in a sense uh, is, is like a bit of a generalization of this theory in a sense, because locally each of these nodes sees uh, six uh, chirals. Um, so I think, um, I mean, you, you can play the deconfinement for generic quivers, just that the fact that this is self-dual, I think has to do with the fact that it's a tree, a bunch of uh, trees. Thank but uh, I mean, you, yeah, there are other dualities with many nodes that you can do. Uh, so, so I don't know exactly what is uh, the, the limits of what one can do with this technology. Just this was an example of quite uh, non-trivial duality that you can prove with this uh, technique. I see. And the anomalies of this theory are ne never the anomalies of the E6, Mina Nemeshansky, for no choice of N and M. Um, okay, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think I have checked. I see. Okay. I mean, we have checked, of course, they normally match in all these frames, of course, but uh, um, no, but I think no, probably the AMAX was not uh, anything particularly nice for what I remember. Mm. Yeah. I see. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm done. So just a final comment is that uh, these uh, steps uh, for the, the confinement uh, can be implemented at the level of the index, uh, of course, where they, and these uh, steps consist in the iterative application of integral identities for elementary dualities inside uh, the index of uh, uh, the, um, the starting theory. And uh, what is interesting is that this technology is precisely the technology that uh, mathematicians like uh, Spiridonov and Reins use to prove uh, the s confining duality. So you, as you know, I mean, you can find in these papers by Spiridon and Reins, the index identities for most of the dualities that we know. And it's curious that the way they derive the, these dualities is really using the, the confinement sequentially. So they, they, they do this procedure, they don't call it like that, but they use fundamental dualities inside the uh, bigger dualities. And uh, as I mentioned, it is interesting also that the same technology appears in a different context, which is in the study of 2D CFT correlators. And in fact, the two examples that I show you of the confinement, uh, so the first one for the OSP2 uh, M theory with six flavors dual to have azimino and the strange uh, cross uh, leg duality, they both uh, appear as uh, in relation to three point correlators in Liouville and Toda theory. Um, so I find it quite funny that the same tools, uh, although with different avatars, appears in very different uh, contexts, like the uh, duality, infrared dualities in quantum field theories, or, or studied of uh, identities like uh, the identities for elliptic hypergeometric integrals, like uh, in the works of Spirit of Reins, or in the study of uh, free field correlations. So I find it amusing that you have not only the same results, but really the same tools that appear. And so maybe this uh, uh, you know, is an indication that we can uh, join forces and learn how to attack this landscape of dualities with different perspectives. I think I'm done. Thank you. Sorry, I'm over time. Thank you very much. Let's thank Sarah. Do we have questions? So, um, uh, do you, in 3D, do you have uh, ways of producing um, 3D mirrors where we didn't know how to do it yet, using uh, some local sequences? Um, good. Um, first, I have to understand how much. Of course, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, as I said, I, we are now entering this world of 4D bed theories, whatever that means. And mm -hmm. uh, indeed, uh, in here, the, we are now, we, I mean, we noticed that there is a problem <laughs> that the propagation of rev is non trivial. So we are trying to understand how to attack this uh, from uh, this perspective. So I don't know. Uh, for sure, um, you know, when the theories are good, the algorithm works uh, fine. And I think I can do well also this uh, SU okay. unitary because I know the mirror map. So I know uh -huh. how to gauge, I can, well, the gauging in four dimension is also something that we are working on, but I mean, in three dimension, given the knowledge of the mirror map, then I can go and make some of the nodes uh, SU and can do this, uh, I don't know, the, the, the locking that you do, I, I think I understand. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes bad, uh, it's bad. <laughs> As the <next> okay. <laughs> so I need to... Uh, mm -hmm. So, so in, in 3D, typically, it's very easy to, let, let's stay in the realm of good quivers. If yeah. we take a linear quiver, then it's, it's very easy to do. But if we have something which is not like a unitary nonlinear quiver, then often the 3D mirrors involve other gauge groups or, yeah, I mean, it's, it's extremely hard. So sorry, do you think that you have a way of, of um, approaching these problems? Sorry, sorry, what is the case? It's a... But if we take a unitary quiver, so all the nodes are unitary, 3D n equals four, but now we have something which is not just a line, so but some, you know, com more complicated graph, then uh, typically finding a 3D mirror is a very hard problem in general. And for the cases we know often actually in the 3D mirror, the gauge groups are uh, not unitary. I see. So, and and uh, um, so now I wanted to know whether you, you think there is any way maybe using these Aharoni dualities or this to to uh, okay. get such pairs I, or? I, um, I haven't looked into that yet. I, um, 
we are looking at circular. Uh, okay. Circular. Um, yeah, I mean circular we can do, but uh, I so you you mean like the the when the quiver like, like bifurcate something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean we could take for example, uh, you know, take a different thinking okay. diagram than a than a, a type. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean uh, we are we are learning to do little bits of things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. This is, so, yeah. <laughs> this is already very nice just to see. Yeah. I mean, for example, I think we can do also the uplift of the types. Okay. Uh, but I mean, the point is that then we have to implement the, you know, the gauging for the, it's, we are working on that. I think that, I mean, the, the uplift of the operation of gauging you want symmetries in 4D, I think by, by now we understand, but we have to, uh, you know, uh, make it uh, sharper. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, for example, star shaped is still a problem. <laughs> yes, this would be one example. Yeah. Star shaped is still a problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, definitely no. At the moment, no, no idea for star shapes. Mm. Okay, thank you. We have more questions. <laughs> a, a question, maybe in the, a bit in the same line, but so here you you mentioned the the four D uplift of this uh, USU gauge nodes. So in the case where you don't have this goodness condition, is the problem that at some point you have you can do uh, Two different dualities. So in in your string of dualities, at some point you have to have a bifurcation or something like that. I, yeah. Because the reason I ask this is because in as you mentioned our brain locking thing, what we observe is that when it's bad in SU, typically you would to describe the the Higgs branch. You can no longer have really three D mirror symmetry, and then you have several quivers that would describe the initial Higgs branch. And I would assume this could be manifest in having a bifurcation in your chain of dualities. Very good. I I don't know yet. I mean, I, the, our problem is the propagation of web that becomes uh, tricky when uh, we pass the goodness threshold, and uh, we need to understand what is the prescription, what to do. At certain point, we got confused, and and we saw your result where you have multiple uh, duals. So we need we are thinking that maybe we will have a an understanding of how you choose to go in a specific direction. I think it has to do with how you propagate the web uh, yeah. along the quiver. So maybe there are some choices of contours in our language that uh, yeah. uh, can be made. Uh, but I, I don't know yet. We are looking into that uh, now. So, but yeah, I'm looking at your result and uh, we are trying to explain them from this different perspective, mm -hmm. if we manage. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, for me, it was quite surprising to see this threshold uh, uh, in 4D. That was pretty yeah. weird. Do you, okay. do you employ knowledge about the moduli space um, when you do these things? Because I, I say it because in, in 3D, when we have these bad theories, what can happen is that the Coulomb branch has multiple singularities. And then at each singularity, you can ask, what is the Higgs branch? And these are the different, different uh, magnetic quivers or local mirrors, if you will, that we find. So by, by taking into account the moduli space uh, somehow and then doing some duality, is there some, some approach? Do you think maybe this is a... Uh, I mean... Think about I, moduli spaces? No, the point is that I, not even for good theory for dimensions, I understand the, the geometry of the moduli space. I mean, I, mm. I see that this theory is cooked up to be an uplift of the 4D theory, but there is more stuff, right? There are yeah, yeah, sure, sure, more, sure. More of, <laughs> so I don't know the full moduli space. Know, it looks the horrible, theory. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's really engineered to be the, to contain uh, in some sense uh, well in a sense as I said uh, several times all the, this part of the 4D quiver have to do with the Coulomb branch in 3D but uh, so in a sense it's simpler because here you know everything uh, is uh, I mean not, not everything but at least you have lots of uh, you you visualize the monopoles as, as uh, normal mesonic operators. Uh, of course, they could be into crazy relations uh, mm -hmm. and ways, but I mean, it's a bit less mysterious from some point of view. On the other hand, the geometric uh, understanding of this uh, mobile space, I, I don't have any. I don't know if there is some, you know, nice hypercarrier structure in some sense. Uh, there is extra stuff. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, but it's, yeah, it's a very good question. It would be nice to know more. 
Sarah, what is bad about these bad theories? Is there anything fundamental bad or they are just, they are not below you, uh, like in yeah, this, this, formal window or something? No, yeah, they do because, uh, as I said, this operator, this meson that you construct, uh, when uh, you have, uh, I mean, it starts falling below the bound, this mesonic operator. So you have decoupling operators, but it's yeah. it's still an SCFT. You believe it's still an SCFT with decoupled operators. So let me ask you the same question in 3D. I mean, so here is, you notice that this operator falls below the bound, then I would just go ahead and flip it and say, okay, I, would you do the same uh, if in 3D? So you have the monopoles below the bound, you flip them and, uh, so uh, from this perspective, uh, you would proceed. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, in 3D, badness of theory, it's not that you, you just don't read the correctly the, the R charges of the monopoles in the UV. It's not that uh, you just have an incorrect R charge of them. It's not, uh, it's not necessarily that they decouple. But, but typically, typically, when you have a bad theory in 3D, that means that some part of the Coulomb branch is uh, essentially smooth. So if you go to the IR, then you're going to get an interacting SCFT plus a free sector. Yeah. Well, if you have a, a good theory, then there is a point in the moduli space where you get a fully interacting SCFT. But this is my understanding of the distinction. Of course, what you say is completely correct that the UV R symmetry is just not telling you about the conformal dimension. But so for me, it's always the appearance of a, of a smooth part in the Coulomb branch. Yeah, yeah. All I'm saying is just not clear that you can flip something very easily. That yeah, no, you know what to flip. Yeah. yeah. But so that, that you have something free appear in the IR, this, I think. So is this the same now in 14.3D? Is this the state? Well, for yeah. something free appearing, usually people call uh, ugly theory. Yeah. So well, I think uh, well, it's ugly, more ugly, than ugly. Uh, ugly, it's free. And then for a bad, it would be it would be smooth but not free but still if you go to the ir then you should just get some i mean really deep ir then you just have some yeah well, yeah it's uh, some okay but okay <laughs> but, but i think the statement is really that if you take this meson and if k is less than 2n and you just uh, do uh, a max then you find that the R charge is negative like you think the dimension of the monopole in a bad theory. So you say, okay, something is weird. So indeed, here I would just go ahead and flip this meson. And this is how I would react if I am a 4D person in n equal one. Then I compare with this and I, uh, you know, um, and it's, a, and, you know it, it's funny that this threshold is, uh, comes together with problems in the propagation of the bed which is a similar problem, I mean, same problem that we have in three dimensions. So um, yeah, I don't want to say that I understand exactly what's going on, but there is, uh, the problem propagates <laughs> to 4D in some sense, maybe it has a slightly different nature, but uh, as a matter of fact, if I want to do the algorithm for this theory for K less than 2N, I need to understand what to do with the propagation of the bed uh, in, some, in one way or the other. And it's possible that I would have multiple choices of the propagation. And I was hoping indeed to see the, you know, the different uh, uh, magnetic dual that uh, should be there in three dimensions. I, I don't know, uh, still uh, open. Okay, do we have more questions for Sarah? Maybe I have another, maybe it is naive, but in, in the 3D setup, you can kind of write um, all these movements in a brain setup, provided you introduce some S walls. Or, and so is there a similar thing in 4D for this um, um, E theory? No, uh, I mean, in fact, this is why I chose to work with the language of 4D, just to see, to see that this is completely, I mean, uh, filtering uh, uh, statement. There is no need to have the brain construction to make this type of statements. It's just using dualities inside dualities. On the other hand, it, it looks that it's begging for some geometry or uh, you know, brain construction because it's really uh, repeating exactly the steps that you have uh, for the local brain dualization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but okay. I don't know. I so don't there know. is no brain interpretation of all these movies I mean, for the at the moment. No, not that, not that I know. No. Okay.
Okay, do we have more questions? Then I would say let's thank Sarah again. Thank you. Have a nice. I will stop the recording. <laughs>